Evening. How is everybody tonight? Good. I was asked that earlier and I said, I think I'm okay. Um, Let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 14. We'll continue our study there. We've been um, we've been looking at the book of Acts and noticing the birth of the church and and the growth of the church, and now we're beginning to see the church uh, really expand throughout the the throughout the world. In Acts chapter one and verse eight. Jesus tells the disciples that you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the remotest part of the earth. Well, they have done that in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and now they're spreading to the remotest part of the earth. <coughs> um, in, in that day, the remotest part of the earth was thought to be Spain. And uh, Paul uh, will attempt uh, to make it to Spain. Um, and so um, a- as you're looking that up, let me remind you of the announcements for tonight. You'll find those uh, in the rack in the lobby. Hopefully you, you got that. You can see what is going on. Um, I remind you that our family picture day is April 6 and 7. So not this Sunday, or not this weekend, but the following weekend. Um, so make sure that you sign up for that. There's a sign-up sheet in the lobby. Uh, so you can, uh, you can sign up for that, and then you'll see all of the other uh, events that are on there as well as our prayer list for those uh, that, uh, that have requested uh, our prayers. The one, one thing that I would add to that list are the, those of our family that are headed to Indianapolis this weekend. Uh, I was asking Jason when they were leaving. Jason is leaving tomorrow, and then uh, most of the group is leaving on Friday. So let's be praying for them for their travels, and for the blessing that uh, LTC is for all of our kids. So uh, be praying for them as well. So make sure you grab one of those. So let's take a look at Acts chapter 14. Let me read verses 1 through 7, and then we'll begin to tackle the the whole chapter and, and bring... bring Paul's first missionary journey to a close. In Iconium, they entered the synagogue of the Jews together and spoke in such a manner that a large number of people believed, both of Jews and of Greeks. But the Jews who disbelieved stirred up the minds of the Gentiles and bittered them against the brethren. Therefore, they spent a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord, who is testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided, and some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. And when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and the Jews with their rulers to mistreat and to stone them, they became aware of it and fled to the cities of Lyconia, Lystra, and Derbe, in the surrounding region. And there they continued to preach the gospel. Let's pray. Our Father, as we look upon your word, as we begin to track these journeys by these first missionaries, we pray that we can see the blessings of missionary work, that we can that we can see the dependence upon you for success and for fruitfulness and grateful that we can see the faithfulness of these servants 
amid severe opposition and just pray that, uh, that we can learn from that, that we can be bolder uh, in our faith as well. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> well, we're about halfway through this first missionary journey. that began in chapter 13 um, and continues through the end of chapter 14. The end of chapter 14, <clears throat> the, um, well, Paul and Barnabas are back at um, Antioch of Syria. We learned last week that there are two Antiochs. Um, we pick them up here in chapter 14 in Antioch of Pisidia which is in what we call modern-day Turkey. When they return to Antioch of Syria, in chapter 15, they will make their way to Jerusalem, and they will meet with the other apostles and the elders of the church to discuss this issue of circumcision, whether it is still binding or not. And so here we are in, in chapter 14, and... And Paul and Barnabas, they have to flee uh, Iconium. There is there's intense uh, Jewish opposition. Um, if you look at 13, verse 50, the Jews incited the devout women of prominence and the leading men of the city and instigated a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust of their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were continually filled with the Holy Spirit. So if you've been following along, if you have, um, if you have your maps in the, in the back of your Bible, it's helpful to keep a finger there on the maps so that you can flip to it and refer to, to where the disciples are headed so from Antioch, they have come down to Iconium. So they're traveling through here, through um, this, is, this, this region that you see in the map here is what we call modern-day Turkey. <clears throat> the, uh, the areas that are indicated in all capital letters are regions. And so you see the Galatian region right above Antioch, um, one of the reasons that I point this out is because when you read Peter's letter, Peter is going to address his letter to those who have been scattered throughout these regions, throughout Pontus and Galatia and Cappadocia and Bithynia. Um, whoops, look at First Peter. To those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And so that's where this, these are the people to whom Peter is going to write his letters. Okay? <clears throat> so, here's a helpful tidbit. This, I'll give you this no extra charge, okay? Um, in 2 Peter... Mm-hmm. Yep, thought I had it. Second Peter chapter three, verse fifteen. Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the unstaught and the unstable distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. So when, when Peter makes this statement in his second letter, he refers to Paul. So you can go back and you can look here in Acts chapter 13 and 14, and then... Um, 
later in chapter 16, 17, 18, <clears throat> you can see Paul traveling through this region again in his second missionary journey. So when Peter refers to Paul's writings, you'll know what he's talking about. And I mean, so the recipients of Peter's letter would know exactly what he's talking about when he makes reference to Paul because they know Paul. Paul has been there. I, th I think it's incredibly significant to hear Peter affirm the teaching of Paul. These apostles are in complete harmony when it comes to their teaching. They're in complete unity. And so Peter is affirming what Paul is writing. And they know Paul, so they would be very familiar with this. And of course, we know <clears throat> that Paul has written to many of these places. Okay, he has, he has written to the Galatians. We know that, right? Because there's a letter called Galatians. Okay? <clears throat> um, we know that he has written to the Ephesians. You see Ephesus way out here <clears throat> on the western side. Uh, he has written to Philippi, uh, which is also out here. He's written to the Colossians, who are in Colossae. Um, the Thessalonians, that, goes, that takes his next journey. We'll get to Thessalonica, Corinth. Um, and then he will write to those who are preaching in these areas. He'll write to Timothy and Titus. Uh, he will write to an individual named Philemon. Uh, and so you, when Peter makes reference to this, they know what Peter's talking about. There's, there's no ambiguity there. Because, and, and in fact, they could pull those letters back out and say, oh, this is what Paul wrote, okay? Um, <clears throat> so just, um, just a couple thoughts there on that. Um, as we pick up Paul's journey in 14, um, the first thing that, that seems to happen is um, the, their message is met with a mixed reaction. There are those who believe and those who don't. Well, that's the same thing that's true today, isn't it? People hear the gospel. They, they hear people teach about Jesus. And um, when, when you're presented the truth about Jesus, you have to make a choice. And... And so you have to either choose in favor of Jesus or against Jesus. He is who he says he is. He is who the disciples, the apostles, say he is. He is who God has said he is. Or he's not. And you have to make that choice. <clears throat> um to not choose to just ignore the question altogether is making a choice. You've chosen to ignore it, deny it. Uh, and so it, it is something that, that calls for a choice. Um, and so there are, there are both Jews and Greeks who are believing here in verse 1. There are Jews who disbelieve. And they stir up the mind of the Gentiles and embittered against the brethren. Embittered them against the brethren. Um, and so it's encouraging though to see that amidst that opposition that Paul and Barnabas stand resolute in, in their work, in their mission. They're not deterred. 
They're not discouraged. They're not uh, dissuade in any way. Because we're told, verse 3, they spend a long time there speaking boldly with reliance upon the, on the Lord. And the Lord is working with them. You remember Mark 16, verse 20? Jesus said that, or God says that the Lord was working with them by performing the signs and the wonders and the miracles. And this is exactly what the Lord is doing here. They were speaking boldly with reliance upon the Lord. He was testifying to the word of his grace, granting that signs and wonders be done in their hands. And so um, from Iconium, there's a short trip down to Lystra. And in Lystra, they meet a man, this is verse 8, they meet a man who has been lame from birth. There was no strength in his feet. He had never walked. What do you think, or why do you think Luke shares those details with us? Yeah, so it, it uh, reaffirms the, the miracle that takes place. Why else do you think that detail is important? The man wasn't healed from an injury. He had never had the ability to walk. Right, so he was not lame because of an injury. He had never been able to walk. What's that? That's right. So this is known by the people who live there. So when Luke, when Luke brings out that idea or that detail, <clears throat> these people know about this man. They know that he's never walked. They know that he's been lame from birth. So there's no trickery involved here. <clears throat> so Luke, Luke just tells us what, what these people already know. It's an important detail. A lot of times today, there are places where this happens, <clears throat> where people use trickery to make you think a healing has taken place when in fact there was no infirmity in the first place. But they present it as such. Okay? <clears throat> That's, that can't be the case here because of this detail Luke provides for us. It's one of the things we appreciate about Luke and, and his writing. Luke, Luke is, um, he has a penchant for the details. And he'll, he'll bring those out. So he's never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke. When he had fixed his gaze on him, when Paul fixed his gaze on the lame man, and had seen that he had faith to be made well. Now, I don't know how he saw that. Paul saw it. That's all I know. Okay? I don't know what he saw in the man. I don't know if, I don't know if it was like, you know, you know, like the best students in a Bible class who are just like on the edge of their seat. They're leaning into it. They're hanging on every word. You, you know? I mean, that's just like you guys. Right? So whatever way, Paul could see that he had the faith to be healed. That was, that was Paul's perspective. And remember, Paul is, 
he's being led and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Paul, it's Luke says, Paul said this with a loud voice. There's another little detail. Stand upright on your feet. What do you, I mean, what do you see the man doing? Well, I'll, I'll try. Let me see if I can do this. Is this how it happens? What does he do? He just jumps up and starts walking. Isn't that incredible? I mean, he puts the whole physical therapy industry out of business. I mean, <laughs> incredible. He began to walk. Now, here's the reaction, okay? <clears throat> when the crowd saw that he began to walk, or when they saw what Paul had done, they raised their voice in the Lyconian language The gods have become like men and have come down to us. Who did? The gods, plural. And they call Barnabas Zeus. You've, you've all heard the name Zeus, right? I mean, he's like the chief god. And then Hermes. So Barnabas is Zeus. And Paul is Hermes. Wouldn't you think it'd be the other way around? So if Zeus, because we, the way we think of Paul and Barnabas, okay, and their names have been reversed now. Remember when they started, it was Barnabas and Paul? And now it's Paul and Barnabas? <clears throat> And Paul was the one that performed the miracle, right? Wouldn't he be Zeus? Why would he be called Hermes? What's that? <laughs> Why would he be called Hermes? What was Hermes? What was, what was he, what was his role as a god? He is the messenger, the spokesman for the pagan gods. That's why Paul is Hermes and Barnabas is Zeus and the people want to worship them. So you have pagan priests, the priests of Zeus, who are bringing animals to sacrifice they want to they wanna join in this worship celebration <coughs> over Zeus and Hermes. It's almost as if Barnabas and Paul have been lost in the excitement of the people. It's now Zeus and Hermes. The priest of Zeus brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. What do Paul and Barnabas say? We're told in verse 14 that they tore their robes. What does that mean, that they tore their robes? Hmm? They rent their garments, all right, King James. Well, yeah, it is a sign of mourning.
That's right. So the same thing happened with, with Jesus between the, Jew, between the Pharisees. And so um, when, when they thought a blasphemy had occurred, they tore their robes. It was a sign of disapproval. And that's what you have here. And so they tear their robes. It's, it's a public demonstration. The people understood this. So when they saw Barnabas and Paul with torn robes, they knew what that meant. They, they do not approve of this worship. <clears throat> but look at what they do. They rush out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We are also men of the same nature as you, and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea, and all that is in them. So what do they do? How do they respond to all of this? They tear their robes, and then what do they do? Start preaching. They preach the gospel. We are men just like you. We're no different from you. So this idea of Zeus and Hermes, get that out of your head right now. You just drop that. Chris? All right, there you, there you go. So that's the ASV. Okay, so the ASV calls Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercury. Okay, that's the Latin. That's what that is. Okay. So, um, Jupiter is the Latin for Zeus, and then Mercury is the Latin for Hermes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, um, good point. Uh, I don't, does, are there any other translations that use Jupiter and Mercury? Okay, um, that's what his is, American Standard. I thought maybe you were in King James. Not yet. <laughs> I love it. Give him time, right? <clears throat> so, in the midst of all of this, Paul and Barnabas see it as just another opportunity to preach the gospel. They don't run away from them. They don't try to avoid them. They're certainly not going to join in with them. They don't flee to the next city. You'll see them do that at times when they feel um, threatened. But they're, they're not threatened here. I mean, the people don't want to hurt them. They want to worship them. <clears throat> and so it's, it's an opportunity to preach the gospel. And so you have, you have Zeus and Hermes, okay? The American standard says Jupiter and Mercury. So you have, but I'll go by the New American Standard, um, the, the, um, the Greek gods of Zeus and Hermes. And, um, and so there's a focus on the gods, plural. And what do we know about Zeus and Hermes? Because Paul draws a contrast between the pagan gods and verse, um, verse 15. There's a contrast between the pagan gods and the living God. So one, the gods are pagan, okay? And, and there's no, there is no life there. there. Secondly, they are gods, plural, and Paul refers to the living 
God, singular, okay? Identified with a definite article, the, meaning that there's only one. He is unique, the living God. There are no other living gods. He is the living God, singular, not gods. Paul makes a huge distinction there. And then he speaks of the living God as the creator of the universe. So when, when the pagans worship their gods, they have all kinds of created images, man-made images. It might be stone, it might be wood, it might be, could be precious stones, it could be silver. We'll see that when they get to Ephesus, okay? When we get to Ephesus later on in chapter 19, <clears throat> you'll see how Ephesus had their silversmiths who were making little trinkets of the goddess Artemis, right? Artemis of the Ephesians, okay? So they're making it out of precious metals, silvers and golds. And Paul says, um, you need to turn from these things to the living God who created all of this. You've used this to create other things, but God created this, the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. He says in verse 16, in the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, yet he did not leave himself without witness. In that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He's saying this is a providential God. All the food you have is because God provided it. We're told in the Bible, somebody have to check me where this is, where God causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. Okay, so these pagan people, these are Gentiles, they would be considered unrighteous. But Paul is saying, look, God caused the rains to come upon you. God is the one who has made you fruitful. He did good. He gave you rains from heaven. He tells them where they're from. He said he satisfied your hearts. God did this to pagan people, unrighteous people. That's what God does. That is nothing like Zeus and Hermes. In the pagan world, when they worship their gods, it's, be, it's because they're afraid of their gods. They're trying to appease the gods so the God, those gods don't harm them. The last thing you want to do is upset one of those gods because who knows what he'll do to you. And he, he flips the coin and shows the living God as a benevolent God, as providentially caring for these unrighteous people, these people who don't know God. It's uh, when we get to Athens and, and Paul preaches on Mars Hill and he finds that altar with the inscription to an unknown God. Okay, these people do not know the living God. And yet Paul says, he has been blessing you. Zeus and Hermes didn't do any of this for you. Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrained the crowds from offering sacrifice with them. They still had to work hard to keep these people from slaughtering these animals, burning these animals, sacrificing them. So verse 19 tells us that Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul. 
and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. They thought they killed Paul. But, now here's verse 20. Now think about this. Picture this in your mind. Paul is laying there on the ground, supposedly dead. While the disciples stood around him, what are they thinking? I mean, what's going through their mind? It's over? Despair? I mean, what just happened? And all Luke says is he got up and entered the city. I mean, I I don't know if I'm reading this wrong, but it's as if the way I hear it, he gets up like nothing happened. He got up and entered the city. Now, I know something happened. They stoned him. I mean, I don't think anybody in here has ever been stoned, have they? I mean, physically. I don't mean emotionally. Okay. Um, I hope not. It's a good thing we don't do that anymore, right? But, Darlene? At least the size of River Rock. At least the size of River Rock. They're not using gravel that we put in our parking lots. Okay? At least River Rocks. I mean, these, are, these rocks are big. I mean, if, you, if somebody started throwing gravel at you, that's going to hurt. But somebody hits you in the head with River Rock, cobblestone. I mean, so we're talking substantial rocks it was so it was an approved method for the Jews for execution in fact they were commanded to stone people for various offenses and so so when they stone Paul it's not like nothing happened But the brevity with which Luke describes this, he got up and entered the city. Marty? Right. I I read one commentary. I forget. I forget which one it was now. Um, But the comment, the the author of the commentary, suggested that Paul was playing dead. It would be, but I think that's absurd. Right. So what, what's the purpose of stoning somebody? Execution. So their objective is to kill him. They're not going to stop throwing stones until they're sure that he's dead. Well, right. They're not going to touch him. So, but they thought he was dead. Now, that doesn't say he was dead. It says they thought he was dead. But so I'll, I'll go with that near death. I mean, I'll, I'm telling you. Um, 
So I, I don't buy the, the playing dead, you know, like pretending. No, I, I don't think that at all because, because of the purpose of stoning and the intent of the stoners, okay? <clears throat> so I, I, I do think that when they left him for dead, that he was as close to dead as he could possibly be. That's my opinion. Right, right. So, but then he gets up and he enters the city. Yes, ma'am. When it says the disciples stood around him, you don't think anything miraculous happened? That they were praying and then he got up? Well, I don't know. Um... I mean, obviously, the text doesn't say they were praying. Right. So they stood around him. Right. In my mind, I'm just visioning that there was some power there from God to cause him. So that, I I do agree with that. I I do think the power of God is at work here. Because, I, like I said, I think, you take that for what it's worth, Paul was as close to death as possible. And it was only by the power of God that he gets up and walks into the city. And all the disciples are standing around. They're not doing anything to help him. I maybe think that they thought he was dead too. You can't add a lot to that, right? That's right. And they left him for dead. Yes. Jerry. You just said he must have been there to have God preserve his life and his mission was not ended. That's right. Exactly. So I, I like that. So he was near death and God preserved him. I, I, I totally agree with you, Judy, that it's the power of God that brought him to his feet again. I, wait a minute. What time is it? Isaiah? It's not time for you yet. <laughs> you got a you got a reputation here, brother. Well, maybe. Yeah. I think when <clears throat> so I think if if you were stoning a person now as a Jew you're certainly not going to touch them to see if they're dead. I mean you're not going to check for a pulse, right? Okay? You can't do that because it's a corpse and now you're unclean according to the law of Moses, right? So the most you would do is stand there to see if somebody's breathing. This is my mind thinking, so. So they dragged him out, I would suggest, I don't know, before he died, so that they're not touching a dead corpse. Um, but, um, But they might be looking to see if he's still breathing. And maybe that's what the disciples are looking for as they're standing around. Well, maybe they were protecting him from not getting further. That could very well be, yes. So there's a lot of speculation that can take place here, and we need to recognize that's all that is. So you've got to be careful with that. Don't read into the text more than what is there. All right? Um, so he enters the city... And then the next day, he went away with Barnabas to Derby. So they go over to Derby. And after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium.
I'm, I'm going to try to uh, be fancy here. So they return to Lystra. That, no, that's not working. I'll try this. They return to Lystra and Iconium and then back to Antioch. I don't know. Can you guys see that up there? Okay. Um, it is bad color, but I'm limited in my options. All right. Um, they're strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith. They're saying through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now look at verse 23. So it's, they're encouraging the disciples. That's, that's one thing you want to see. They are encouraging the disciples. They want them to stay faithful. Now, Paul's going to write letters to them in the future doing the exact same thing. But look at verse 23. What do they do in verse 23? Appoint elders in every congregation. How long have these men been Christians? Okay, look at, hold your finger there and go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Verse 6. This, this is Paul writing to Timothy, who at the time is the evangelist in Ephesus, the preacher in Ephesus, okay? And one of his tasks is to appoint elders in the church. And in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, you have the qualifications that Timothy is to use in selecting men to serve as elders. Verse 6 tells us one of those qualifications. What is that? Cannot be a recent convert. What's that? Or he may become conceited and fall into the condemnation incurred by the devil. I just think that's interesting. Now, we're talking about Paul. Okay, we're not talking about you and I. We're not talking about even Timothy, okay, the evangelist. We're talking about the inspired apostle, Paul, who is appointing elders in these churches. I just find it interesting that these elders are appointed so quickly after the church is established. Marty? Everybody's a recent convert. That's right. That's right. So I think it shows us <coughs> at least the importance that Paul places, led, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to place godly leadership in every congregation. Paul teaches us the importance of elders in every congregation. You read your Bibles, you cannot get around the idea that God wants elders, godly elders, qualified elders, men of character elders in every congregation. That's what Paul tells Titus to do. Titus chapter 1, I left you in Crete that you would appoint elders in every congregation. How many congregations? Every one of them, right? No. It is um, a couple years tops. So like between Antioch and Iconium and Jerusalem and then to go back, it's been a while. 
It's been a while, but it's been a short while. So it's not like he appointed him elder right then. He did it. So the whole, if I remember right, and I might have said this last week, is this, I think it's this missionary journey that goes from about 43 to 47 A.D.? So, I mean, there, there are a few years involved in the whole journey, okay? Because remember, somebody pointed out last week that they're walking, right? So, um, you know, when I, when I go to Ethiopia, I don't have to walk down to the, the Atlantic coast, pick a city, Okay, Washington, D.C., whatever, and board a ship and then sail all summer over to Ethiopia or Africa and then walk across Africa till I get to Ethiopia. I don't have to do that. Hallelujah, I don't have to do that. I, I can fly from Washington, D.C. right into Addis Ababa. Boom, it's done. It's 14 hours, but it's done. Okay, Um these men don't have that. These men do have to go down to the port city. They do have to board a ship. They do have to sail. They do have to walk. That's how they get around. So that's why this journey takes, if I remember right, it's like from A.D. 43 to 47. Um, and so we're talking. But still, that is a relatively short period of time. We would, not, we would not consider appointing an elder that's been a Christian for four or five years, would we? Not typically, right? Maybe on rare occasion, a guy might step up. But typically, we're not going to do that, Okay. We look, we look for guys who've been in the church for 100 years before, and then we'll appoint them elders, right? Okay? Well, you haven't been in 100 years. <laughs> Feels like it sometimes, don't it? <laughs> <clears throat> so in any event, that's where they are, and that's what they're doing. They're appointing elders. Um. He does remind us in ver- at the end of verse 22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. What does that tell you? Tough times. Tough times. Being a Christian is not always easy. People will oppose you for that. People will make fun of you for that people who don't understand the nature of the gospel. Shasta? Yeah. Position brings opposition. Yeah. And so we're just reminded that although there are those who promise you the rainbow if you become a Christian... The Bible doesn't teach that. We just need to be aware of that. It helps us to make that choice. When we're we're presented the truth about Jesus, you got to make a choice. And Paul reminds us that choosing Christ is not always the easiest choice. Now here, you'll face opposition from the outside, from people who don't understand the nature of the gospel, who don't know Jesus, who don't know God. And, and that's the opposition that they encounter here. But oftentimes we find that being a Christian is difficult because of our own transformation. Because of dying to the old self and living for Christ. Christ. And that will make it difficult because those old desires you recognize now 
they do not honor Christ. They're not worthy of the gospel. And, and we are instructed to live worthy of the gospel. And that makes it tough sometimes. But it doesn't make it impossible. Oh, darling, I'm sorry, I didn't see your hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a good thought, 2 Corinthians 11. And Paul describing his sufferings, you're, I mean, we're seeing those right here. Okay? So, they appointed elders in every church. They had prayed, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So then they pass through Pisidia, and they come to Pamphylia. Now, I told you that Pamphylia is this region right down here. When they had spoken the word in Perga, so they come back down to Perga, they went down to Italia. That's not on the map, but Italia is, is right over here. And then from Italia, they sailed to Antioch. They, they're back home. And when they get back to Antioch, you have the very first mission report presented to the church because that's who sent them. Listen to what they do. They sailed to Antioch from which they had been commended commended to the grace of God for the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived, they gathered the church together and began to report all things that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Can you imagine this report? They call the church. Can you imagine this meeting? I mean, this is going to take a while. So in an hour, we've covered this whole trip. Well, two hours, because last week we looked at the first half of the trip. Tonight we looked at the second half of the trip, okay? Well, I promise you that that meeting lasted longer than that. That's just my own belief. Because they're reporting everything that was going on. Can you imagine the questions that they were asking? They spent a long time with the disciples in verse 28. What a great church Antioch was. Was. If, as we read through Acts, we're going to discover churches that used to be great. Ephesus was a great church. Um, Colossae was a great church. I mean, Philippi, that was a joyful church. Corinth, good church or bad church? You got 2 Corinthians, right? So they turned things around. Yeah, so, uh, and then, you, of course, you've got the church in Rome, okay? So, <clears throat> by the time you get to Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the Lord is writing letters back to these churches. The very churches that we're looking at right now. The church in Laodicea, the church in Smyrna the church in Pergamum, the church in Ephesus, the church in Thyatira, the church in Philadelphia. The Lord is writing to all of these churches. <clears throat> Save two. Two churches have no condemnation from the Lord. But the other five, they're all losing their way. 
they're compromising the faith. They're losing their first love. These were good churches. Listen, the last thing I want to hear a hundred years from now. Oh, I remember sunset. Oh, it was a good church. I don't want to hear that. Do you? Marty? Yeah, that's right. They're lukewarm, right? So, um, so here we have it. We have the end of the first missionary journey. So next week we're headed to Jerusalem. All right? So from here, we're going to travel back down to Jerusalem. Okay? And we're going to talk about circumcision. What's that? I'll talk about circumcision. You guys chime in though, all right? We'll talk about that. Let's pray together. Father, it's a blessing to come and study your word. I realize that we have probably skimmed the surface of the details of this missionary journey. As we, as we go over it again, I pray that we would be able to recognize those meaningful details that teach us what it means to be a disciple, to be faithful, to be gospel-driven. And I pray that you put that on our hearts as we go out into the world tonight and tomorrow and every day. Help us to be gospel-driven. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good to be with you tonight.